Welcome back to the semester. The school year getting started and uh, bringing everybody back together. So I really appreciate everyone who was able to get to us today. Um, as usual, we'll be continuing this month by month. And so you'll continue to get your invites. And uh, we've got a whole stream of people lined up to present all the way into the first of the year at this point. And we get lots of volunteers and lots of coordination of speakers. And we're really lucky today to have one of our regulars come and speak with us. Victoria Freeman with Sieber has been one of our regular attendees, and so we're going to get to hear from her today. She's going to talk about population and economic growth associated with the Northern Beltline Highway Project. And I told her that those of us at CAPS are very interested in the transportation side of all of this. So this will be very relevant to us and then those of you who are also interested in it from other disciplines. So I'm going to go ahead and let her start the presentation, and when she's done, we'll go into our question and answer and discussion. Okay. Good afternoon. I'm a researcher at the Center for Business and Economic Research, and we have a bunch of uh, cyber people there today. Um, cyber conducted a study on the Northern Beltline and, uh, and specifically econo socioeconomic impacts um, that relate to the <coughs> construction of this highway. We looked at population and economic growth related to the Northern, Northern Beltline. So Northern Beltline of future I-422 highway is one of the major transportation projects for Alabama, as probably most of CAPS people know. And uh, it is uh, located, it will, should be located at the north, to the north of Birmingham in Jefferson County. Now construction on the first segment has already started and uh, this picture you can see is uh, from June of this year. So it's uh, well uh, on the way. According to Alabama Department of Transportation, uh, construction is on schedule. So it is expected by that by fall of next year, the first segment will be completed as it was planned. That's good news because the first segment is only 1.34 miles, whereas the whole Northern Beltline is more than 50 miles long. So you can imagine that being on schedule is quite a good way. Um, and again, according to the Department of Transportation, with all the planning, uh, planning and construction, we are still on schedule in order to complete the entire roadway by hopefully 2040. So, long time from now. Using the shapefile, shapefiles from the Alabama Department of Transportation, we can see nicely in the maps, this is uh, most current, uh, up-to-date uh, shape, and uh, approximately 15 exits are planned, but only about half of them are finalized. By finalized, I mean they have GPS location, but um, most of the exits are still in the prelim preliminary phase. Now we used the shapefile um, of Northern Beltline and created a buffer zone three miles to each side of the this pink line. I guess it's pink. Sorry. Yes, I was just, just before presentation, I was looking at this, how cool is this tool, and so apparently I didn't, I've never used that, but it's very nice. Can I ask a question? Yes. Where it shows where it frowns up there on the top, it's not going to reconnect with 459, right? No. At the end, on the upper right hand corner, now keep going to your right. 59. Yeah. 59, yes. So the, the whole stretch of 50 miles, so it will start, in the, okay, it will start to the south west of Birmingham here, a junction of four, I-459 to uh, and I-20, right? And then go all the way around and reach uh, I-59. 
that's the plan. And so you can see 459 actually goes only here. It will be my much wider belt line compared to the current sovereign belt line. Now the first segment is to the north of Pinson. It's here between uh, Highway 75 and 79. And that's there. You can see relatively on the map, you can see the relative length of that segment that will be finished by next fall and the whole highway that needs to be completed. That's a huge project. Now, again, we used the shape file from the Department of Transportation and created buffer zone. So shape file, uh, northern belt line is red line, whereas buffer zone, three lines uh, in each direction is uh, kind of pink peach here. And uh, that creates a six mile corridor that uh, we try to look what, what is planning, uh, what is projected to happen in this corridor. Now, we overlaid this map with the map of census block groups. Now, the census block groups of the corridor are highlighted yellow. Why we used census block groups is uh, because a census block group is the smallest geographical unit for which uh, data, socioeconomic data, are tabulated. And in order to forecast population, we better have this data to make reliable projections. Um, the problem or the, uh, it's not the problem, but the issue of the census block groups is that generally there are between 600 to 3,000 people and uh, they will stretch in rural areas. So you can see in the, here in Blount and St. Clair and here, they will stretch uh, for wider than six mile radius, just because they will need to scratch more to get that extra person or two in rural areas. So using this map and overlaying all the nice ArcGIS uh, tools, we were able to see that there were 102 census block groups in the corridor in the vicinity of the Northern Blood Line. Um, as of last census, there were 165,466 people living in that area. Uh, they were living in around 63,000 households. And the average density of that area was about 254 people uh, per square mile. We actually went to a field trip following, trying to follow our GPS locations of the Beltline. And you can see here on the left is a future possible site of uh, Northern Beltline reaching this I-59, that's I-59. And to the right, it's um, proximity of a possible future exit. That's a beautiful pastoral picture area. Um, because the goal of Northern Bethlehem is to improve commuting, improve traffic, we look at the commuting profiles. Now maybe it would be uh, more interesting that the census provides very uh, good application. And so on the map, you can actually see where workers who are employed in the four counties surrounded the area, and including Jefferson County, where people who are employed in these four counties where they actually live. And so the blue areas uh, indicates the density and the light areas the less uh, lower density. Now, by the nature of the counties, Jefferson and Walker counties are more job centers, whereas St. Clair and Blount are suburban and, uh, well, almost two thirds of their population actually commute to work outside their counties. So that's why you can call it suburban county characteristics. Okay. When looking only at people who are employed in Jefferson County and where do they live, uh, you can see density more clearly. 
and that's population density there where they live. And you actually also can see the direction report from here. You can see direction uh, where they commute, but also the size of the commute. So for example, you can see that most people commute from northeast and from the south. And interesting fact that population, the very light areas, those who commute actually more than 50 miles here. Uh, mostly they commute from the south or from the north, basically along the I-65, and that's a major transportation area, uh, route. That's where the people are commuting them more than 50 miles, mostly. In addition to commuting profiles, uh, we looked at business location in Northern Belt and Corridor, but also in the area surrounding that. So here's a nice, very crowded map. Now, each green dot represents a location of organization or business establishment. So you can, well, quite logically see it's almost black in, in Birmingham, in the city itself. But also interestingly, uh, along the major highways, how nicely, you can see how nicely business locations are, uh, businesses are located. These data are from Dan and Bradstreet, and they also provide data on the type of businesses. So when we look at the corridor itself, well, first of all, that's the corridor with the block groups. And you can see how the densities, how lower density is here compared to uh, populated and dense uh, area to the north, kind of, uh, to the south, southeast <coughs> of the corridor. As I mentioned, the type of uh, businesses are available. So you can nicely see that some uh, black squares are occasional manufacturers. I'm not sure if you can, can you see? And uh, then you have purple diamonds for retail stores and some very light blue for accommodation and uh, food service places, so hotels and restaurants. So they are usually clustered along the highways. Another way to look at it is by overlaying with incorporated places map, which actually allows you to see how sometimes businesses, sorry, sometimes businesses are neatly located within their incorporated area. Like some here or those Sylvan Springs here. So they, it's very nice, nicely located because when we plan to project this location, it's important to know what is the current distribution. But also you can see it still along the major highways pattern continues even though they are in non-incorporated areas. Our CBER forecasting group uh, has forecasted uh, using the in-house Alabama County econometric models has forecasted uh, output and employment uh, for the state and the counties. Using an assumption from uh, state and national econo uh, econometric models and uh, forecast available from, for example, IHS Global Insight. It was expected that around uh, about five major industry sectors will be affected most. And that's based on the previous study of the similar projects and some logic because uh, you have, first of all, it's construction, which is uh, quite <laughs> logical, but uh, which also include not directly highway construction, but also indirectly uh, new businesses construction or new residential houses construction and the area development. <coughs> then you have manufacturing wholesale trade uh, which should benefit, uh, well manufacturing especially, should benefit from the uh, increased 
available workforce because the better commute uh, will uh, make the pool of the available work for, uh, workforce larger and um, which is very beneficial for manufacturers especially. Now both manufacturing and wholesale trade businesses should benefit from industrial sites located in the vicinity of the corridor. There are several uh, industrial sites, sites already developed and some of them are still require some infrastructure but this is uh, in future a perfect location for, for this. And again retail and recommendation food services. So we expect as uh, if, in, if infrastructure will be developed then along exits along the highway and of course a new, uh, new areas of development. Um, these are the industries that uh, are expected to grow. But as a nature, by the nature of the Northern Beltline project, uh, most of the uh, most output and employment gates uh, will be in uh, Jefferson County. And uh, again, assuming completion by 2040, which so far will it hold through, uh, Jefferson should gain around uh, 25,000, 24,600 people uh, and extra $4 billion in gross domestic project, uh, product or GDP. <coughs> The straight line, if you look at the maps, um, at the graphs, the straight line uh, is a baseline series that don't take, in, uh, don't take into account a northern baseline. So how would the county develop without it? Whereas development or alternative series uh, are the results of uh, northern baseline development and its impact on the, on the county. Now I should notice that uh, if you have a question about why we suddenly start growing uh, so much, I should note that if you see the graph is divided and there are different scales. So you have to the left you have five years, the most recent years, and to the right you have 25 years. So that's why it's a sudden, yeah. oh no, we should start growing actually. Very. <coughs> And so uh, the difference between these two scenarios and development scenarios is that employment uh, will, um, in will be uh, by 2040, there will be 489 people, um, uh, 489,000 people employed um, in the county. Accordingly, GDP uh, should increase uh, not by 78, not uh, to be 78 billion, but uh, to be 82 million, 82 billion. Uh, that's the GDP of the or output of the Jefferson County at the end of um, once the Northern Bedline is completely constructed. We also projected the number of businesses, so all this nice maps I showed you before about business locations. So we expect, uh, we would expect uh, the increase, uh, an increase of uh, 1,600 business establishments. Um, but as a result of Northern Beltline, it should increase to about, uh, by about 2,000. And the uh, uh, growth rate should increase accordingly from 22% to actually 26.9%. Before projection, projecting population, we looked at historical trends, some socioeconomic factors and density of population. So I'll, I'll show you some historical trends. And these cities along Sovereign Beltline or I-459 uh, we took it as a development comparison to see what we could, could we expect once the Beltline is finished. And now uh, if you want to ask what, the, what is the result of the Beltline, Sovereign Beltline, 
The answer is it depends. You have Bessemer that declined. And I should note that for those of you who don't know about the history about I-459, uh, it started in 1968. Uh, in 1978, the first segment was finished, completed. And uh, all Sovereign Beltline uh, was completed by late 1984. So you kind of then you can kind of see that um, that, that's why we went all the way back to 1980s to see what happened. Now, again, Bessemer declined. Homewood and Mountain Brook stayed around the same. And of course, Hoover saw a rapid increase in its population. And not only in the past decade, whereas uh, followed by Vestavia Hills and Trussville, and Vestavia Hills mostly was in the past two decades, the, this growth. And also Irondale has increased. Now there could be several reasons for population of the city. Um, increase, decline, or stay the same. And so you can map them, it can be economical. Um, but also, for example, in Homewood, you have a city that is surrounded by incorporated areas. So where do you think geographically you can grow? Um, there's nowhere un unless they decide to build skyscrapers, skyscra which is unlikely. And again, Hoover, it's a great example of how the city embraces annexation policies. And uh, one of the reasons it grew so rapidly is once the city embraces annexation policies and follows and implementing the development strategies, um, it can grow like crazy. Trustful as well. Um, now when we look back to the places that are located in the future northern Bethlehem vicinity, the historical trends also varied. And you, know, you have Bessemer and Trustville in both sides of the highways. So, but uh, Bessemer and Fairfield saw a decline. Morris and Warrior stayed around the same. And uh, then Pinson is a newly incorporated place. So it grew quite a lot. You have Trustville and Kimberley. Now again on the map, and talking about other reasons why the city population declined, have Fairfield, I don't know if you heard about US Steel, and so they, they struggle quite a lot historically and they continue to struggle and losing hundreds of workforce, uh, uh, hundreds of jobs in the city, it's not a good sign and it good, not a good thing for the city at all. Now for those Morris and Warrior, the ones that stayed around the same. Actually, during our field trip, uh, we visited Morris and the town officials told us that they wanted to keep this small town feel. Um, and that their resident wanted to have this small town feel, which tells me that they probably would not grow much um, if they don't want to. And again, Pinson, it's newly incorporated with annexation, has uh, experienced growth in Trustville, had, uh, and st has uh, quite successful development plans, and uh, they still have uh, a lot of new development plans, and they keep implementing them, so we expect basically the growth to continue. Uh, this is population density map of the latest census by census block groups. So if you wondered how, uh, what this 102 census block groups in the corridor look like, so they are there. And their uh, borders are crazy and they change in every census, which uh, gives us headache to really actually compare. In order to project population, you have to compare two censuses. But uh, we did that. 
And with the density map, you can see how obviously Birmingham city is very dense, but also sort of how well you can distinguish between several shades of yellow, but in the Northern Belt Line, this and this corridor, the density, um, the color is uh, darker. So that means uh, it's high density. And the uh, rural areas uh, here, and so in, in between here, uh, uh, have lower density. So all this information getting in, and um, finally we, could, we were able to project populations. We used cohort component metal, uh, method for our uh, for state and county population projections. If you are very interested, I can talk about it for hours. If not, uh, basically, uh, what does it uh, what it does? It uses cohorts of population, so uh, say age groups and race groups, and then just takes these groups of population and age them over time. Uh, sometimes added some deaths there to the mix, sometimes, uh, and of course, some births. And voila. For the smaller population uh, areas, uh, like city and block groups, we use a combination of uh, several methods because it's such a issue-prone <laughs> um, projection. So we, we do adjust the small area population projections by uh, some socioeconomic and demographic data. And that's why the census block groups uh, come in handy, because they have this data. We looked at approved development projects in the area. And also other indicators, uh, age of housing stock and school rankings, which the latter is very important for the perceived quality of life, or actually quality of life. And um, actually perceived quality of life is very important uh, for new residents decided to move in uh, to become future new residents. Here are the, our population projections. Again, baseline uh, R, uh, baseline series, the straight line, uh, not dotted line, is the, uh, what would happen if there were no Northern Belt Line. And then dotted line, is the alternative for development scenario that takes into account uh, Northern Belt Line. <coughs> and you can see we expect then population increase in that Northern Belt Line corridor specifically from 165,466 to about uh, 195,573 as a result of the Northern Belt Line. So a growth of around uh, 30,000 people just as a result of the Northern Belt Line. And uh, hold, um, should have a disclaimer maybe in the beginning, but I can have it right now. Uh, given that everything goes as planned, all the assumptions will hold, and so on. And sometimes it's nice to visualize data uh, with the map. So here is the, our baseline population growth by census block groups. And then here you can uh, actually see the, the diversity. We expect some areas in Bessemer to decline, some areas such as Makala to increase. Uh, the population is, is still expected to increase. And, uh, Trust will continue, uh, expect continue grow, uh, growing population. Um, St. Clair and Blount County specifically, the ones, as I mentioned, it kind of suburban, suburban uh, they are expected to grow, uh, to have uh, population growth. And some areas are expected to decline. Here's some part of Graceville, if you are familiar. Yes? It looks to me where the areas where the belt line's going to go through and you see where 78 is. Are mm -hmm. Why are you predicting that the population growth is going to remain so small in those green areas there? Wouldn't that help? You mean the green area? They're a small yeah. one? Uh, it's uh, because uh, each sensor block 
is different. It, uh, overall, the city actually will grow, but you know how the growth uh, is, has different level. You have some areas in the city uh, will uh, decline, some areas population will increase. So census block groups actually allow uh, to see that uh, the level of uh, of that uh, okay. census block group allow to see the level uh, lower level of uh, in clarifying level how the population will increase in some areas of the cities even uh, and can increase in other areas. What is what is driving the population drop in the best area? <coughs> in Bessemer? Yeah, why, why would it go down? Right. Well, that's what I'm wondering. <laughs> Schools. <laughs> Schools, quality yeah. of life. Migration. Yeah, out migration. Out migration, and schools. School. And then I actually thought that the economic uh, forecast that had in there also had not much activity growth for Bessemer. Okay. One of the things that influences it is commuting. Yeah. So, so while the, the belt line is, I mean, provides increased access, it also facilitates commuting. So I don't know. Well, right, I can someplace exactly. else and drive in. Right. 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 So that's why she's saying, you know, at the blood group level, you have more detail, so you can see portions of cities which yeah. will lose out, but yeah. other parts of the city might gain. Mm -hmm. Jefferson County is also a population. I'm sorry, what was that? For the same reason. Jefferson, Jefferson, Jefferson County, County is also losing population. Oh. I mean, it's right now minus 0 0.5, I believe. Uh, so it's still, it's kind of balancing, but it's losing. One of the reasons, as, as I mentioned, these are uh, job center county. And if people can leave and commute from say, Blount and St. Clair, uh, our county surrounding that. Why not if they see that better quality of life there? Okay. One of the things to note on the Northern Belt Line is also for commercial traffic. Right. Uh, and so what it will do is it will ease that a lot. That is the main driver for ALDOT's interest because the existing 20, 65, 59 you know, malfunction yeah. junction <laughs> is, a pro is a problem for, right. for others. And this will ease right. that, so it improves safety as well. In your, but I, I still, I don't think I'm asking my question properly. Where 78 is, you don't anticipate that to grow, but you do anticipate on the other side of 65 that area to grow. Why would there be a disparity? Well, actually, it, it's not that we don't anticipate, it's that you, you're looking at this, you're talking about this one, I'm sorry, this one? No, to the left. Here? Yes. Okay, uh, this is Graceville. Right. And it was hit, uh, but, well, there are several factors that's going on and that's, uh, well, it's part of that city. And that area in particular, it's actually uh, being developed uh, more like businesses. So if you, if you drive along, uh, this uh, we draw along 78. It's really businesses coming in, and we expect they will continue coming in. And once the businesses, you don't want to be living and surrounded by um, your fast uh, loans and uh, you know, retailers. You, we expect people, as they continued before, to actually move a little bit away uh, to more uh, nice residential areas. <coughs> Well, at least that's okay. that yeah, we saw. The business districts. Yes. Right. So yeah, that's I've been you're seeing population before. growth. Mm -hmm. And since, yeah. Yes. One other interesting thing I uh, see so here is, I guess up there in Buck County in the Benson area, you're expecting larger than 20% growth? Uh, yes. Uh, well, I, I find this kind of interesting. How much of that is really actually related to the belt line? Because the pathway to get to Benson isn't affected by this, you, know, you already have your, what is that, 70 it looks like? So this baseline before? This is the baseline, right? This is the baseline, yeah. actually, yes. So, uh, but the, yes. But in general, uh, this, so the census blocks, the population density here is very uh, low. And so even when we talk about 20% growth, 
you know, the, the base is small. Yeah, it's not, yeah, it's, it's not trustful. Actually, the trustful would be an example how uh, percent is high and level is high, so you expect a large number of people moving in. Over there, it's not that much. Just the level. This is growth rate. So this is the baseline without accounting for the... No one met mine. Yes. Thank you. Questions, comments? Yes. On, on the, the previous slide there, I realized that was just a baseline without the, without the northern bell line. But let's, let's say there's increases in the light brown, the dark brown, or the eastern quadrant there. Where, where, where are those people with or without the bell line? Where is that population growth going to work? What is their projected community pattern? From uh, which areas are you? So, so the, 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 the northeast quadrant, the Pence and St. Clair County, all the brown and light brown areas. Yeah. This one? Yes. Just, just sort of all up in that area. Mm -hmm. the, that increased population, the majority of those people will, will, will work, will live out there and work in the Birmingham metro area. In Jefferson County. In Jefferson County. And yes, so not necessarily the Birmingham area, but Jefferson County. So it's, uh, <coughs> the reason is, Northern Be construction of the Northern Beltline will also use commuting in their Southern Beltline. So if you had, uh, if you had seen the traffic in Birmingham, I have seen the traffic in Birmingham uh, in the morning rush hour, um, Right now, uh, the way it is right now, it's crazy. You have three line, free lines are all standing. So hopefully, uh, what the goal is basically to ease the traffic, and hopefully then uh, you have uh, people are easily easier to commute, even if they use the same uh, commuting uh, routes. That's how uh, the answer. A baseline origin destination study. Do we know what the commuting patterns are now in those uh, areas? No, they haven't, and partly because they haven't finished specifying exits along the highway. Uh, that that influences, you know. Uh, but do we have a full? Do we have a full accounting of, of, of where people in the north are driving? Well, for current for, uh, current commuting, yes, we always do this an annual um, data map that comes out of our Department of Labor has that on their website, so you can go there and see what what commuting is like uh, currently. But what we when we project uh, part of projecting uh, establishments is also the likelihood of locations, etc. Now without without knowing the final set of exits, it's, it's tough to really do their project out the community. Um, the other thing to consider is the, the uh, RGBC folks, the regional transportation folks, are also always looking for other modes of transportation. And even though those are not funded now, because we are looking at the 30-year timeline you have to allow for that as an uncertainty. But that, <coughs> that would change commuting patterns as well. It, it could be. Well, that was the uncertainty I was wondering. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, have you done any type of projection work for the impact that the Northern Beltline will have on the Southern Beltline? On the commuting? Yes. No, we we looked at the socioeconomic impact, so mm -hmm. we didn't uh, uh, project right. uh, specifically commuting. Uh. But it's an excellent question because um, actually the control is the state's population, state's economy. So definitely that effects that's going to happen there. Mm -hmm. um, if she had plotted out, you know, kind of the, what we expected to look 
like with the differential, you would have seen a similar thing happened with uh, the southern uh, 459 had <coughs> low density areas like you're seeing up north. But from 84 to now, you know, you're looking at roughly 30 years and you go to 459 and you don't recognize it if you were around <laughs> 30 years ago. Uh, that is what we expect should come up north too. Except 459 had an advantage based on layout of uh, infrastructure. Uh, there was a lot more infrastructure to the south than there is up to the north. So there, there is a lot more to be built in. Uh, and that's mainly because of ownership of land. Um, and so that's, that's another, you know, to, to satisfy Stephen, <laughs> that's another point of uncertainty uncertainty. Once you don't know how ownership will change, you, don't, you can't really forecast zoning and things like that. But, so the, the question really becomes, what is the shelf life of a study like this? And uh, we basically, basically tell DOT it's max five years. Because there's new information that comes. <coughs> I just wanted to find out, the Northern Beltway, is that set in stone where it's going to be, what you show us? Oh, well, they, they say it is, but... <laughs> 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 uh, there are, I believe they say there are 99 places where the road has to pass the area where a creek or some um, environmental um, or other area. Um, so, uh, here it is, yes. <laughs> We, is there somewhere I can go to see a map of where exactly that's going to go? That puts it right on the roads that there is a little closer, something a little more detailed? I don't know. Before, before it's, it used to be on other side, before all the, <laughs> 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 you know, all the political stuff. I don't know how. But, so I, I, I haven't looked at the site for it. They, they pulled it when they, they were the, all the initial uh, uh, <laughs> fight back and all that. I'll give it a shot. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and Sam, this may not be a question to be answered as seriously for Birminghamians. So you say that one of the motivations behind this is pulling commercial traffic off the inner city right. route, which I agree right. would be a benefit. So is there not some discussion, is there not some way to use this study to rationalize the discussion of the whole 2059 downtown, what its future should be? It, well, the, the, I mean, you raise a very good point. I mean, I mean, why, why, why spend for the big reconstruction and continue, right. the, you know, the, the negative effects on downtown Birmingham right. if in this time frame right. we're going to be bleeding off the commercial traffic anyway? Right. Not the. Uh, it's a very good point. But what I generally tell folks, and usually the young ones can't really picture it, is um, throw yourself 30 years back. And you see that the demand on the routes would increase astronomically from, you know, if you throw yourself 30 years back. So then you'd come back to today and you project 30 years forward and you try to have a similar differential and you'd realize, oh, okay, we can't, just because we are solving this in 30 years, we can't not do something about 2059 downtown. The, the real but they the, do small things, not the big. Right. The, the, you know, the, the question would be the, uh, the question for the downtown portion. And usually that, that's often discussed separate from the network. And that, I think, is, is wrong. Because you have to discuss that core. Because that core part is what he showed is the core of everybody passing through. So you have to discuss it in relation to the whole network that it's a central part of. And uh, I've seen... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, for example, you can't discuss it separately from 280. If you do, if you do that, you failed the planning for, for, for that. Um, 
and I know we've been approached by both sides, those who want it and those who don't want it. <laughs> and we tell them, sorry, we don't do analysis with the results in mind. So, <laughs> <laughs> so that <laughs> 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 so, <laughs> Other questions, comments, answer. You said that the one section of one point something miles is almost completed. What is the next section after that? And when is that proposed? <coughs> okay. Uh, oh, that's completed. It's 75, 78, uh, 79. Start. That's the start. Will be completed at, uh, by fall of next year. Right. Uh, the next question, I believe they changed the, the timeline. <laughs> During the course of the study, I've seen several timelines. So um, the latest I saw is uh, around 65. Uh, let's see. Yes, uh, around, I'm sorry, around 65, yes. So 65 and uh, 31. Yeah. That's the latest I saw. That's next. Which and and then. 65 on the left or the right when I'm looking here? Well, between. Let's see. Here. Between. Oh, there between we yes. So the next section so is, is the peel off the commercial yeah. traffic that's going yeah. 65. Yeah, with the latest. Uh, well, what section would it be? From 65 going to the left or from 65 going to the left? No, uh, well, it's first we start with this in between, right. and then, uh, yeah. And I think, and also they, they close after, I mean, quite soon after that, they should do these ones. Oh, okay. So they, they try basically to connect two highways that already right. exist. They're not starting in one place and just going around. It's going to be no, piecemeal kind no. of thing. Yeah. And so th that's why one of, the, one of the problems is that you, uh, in order to, uh, to have benefits of, uh, to benefit from this northern belt line, you actually have to have the whole <coughs> belt line completed. Right. right. And yes. They, they, they prioritize based on traffic flows. Oh. So, so you'll notice that the segments are kind of joining existing flows right. areas, and that's how they prioritize. So, in essence, the rural segments become the last portions. Um, but they also have to prioritize based on funding. Yeah. From of course. Um, and the land ownership. And the land ownership. <laughs> so, so that's, that's part of it. But they, they actually had a 17-year build-out, too. That's been scrapped. Um, so now the build-out is a 20 to 30-year span. So uh, as soon as we started having problems with funding in uh, Washington, D.C., they scrapped the 17-year fast track. As this goes, as large corporations decide to start putting things out here, like a, you know, a big car manufacturing, which would be highly likely, would that change the projections and also change DOT's planning? Um, yes and no. The, 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 and actually, that's a really good question. What the, the automotive companies use radar and in determining what their networks are. So they don't look, they, uh, Toyota uses a 400 mile radius. You know, Mercedes would use a 110 or something like 120. I don't know what Hyundai uses. <laughs> uh, and Honda uses something in between. And when they plan out, they, they include uh, the likely places of their suppliers, etc. So we don't know that. That's why I say yes and no. Um, they also use workforce availability, uh, knowing commuting patterns to plan these things out. Um, so if there is, a, a, say, if take a look at Vans. Vans itself is not growing that fast because right. most of the workers are in Jefferson County and <laughs> in Tuscaloosa County, right. but in Tuscaloosa area. So Vans itself may not be affected as much. Mm -hmm. And we, uh, for the socioeconomic ICI, we look at the six mile segment and its block group. So the main thing would be, and that's why I said the shelf life of a study like this is maximum five years. So once you know, one of the factors you mentioned uh, uh, is approved developments. So 
So once you know some, you know something new, mm -hmm. you can include it, incorporate it in the analysis later. So okay. basically, uh, uh, if any of you have friends in DOT, tell them they need to come and give us more money for another study, <laughs> <laughs> or at least in two years. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But that's that's that's. Uh, Basically, one of the things that uh, uh, I think you mentioned it's elsewhere, but this migration uh, influences uh, population projections. Uh, by when we say migration, people typically think international migration, but there's a whole lot of migration, domestic migration that occurs, and that's important as well. Actually, that's what she, she was referring to with urban suburban splits. You know, people working in one area but living in another area. So that's a bedroom community to another uh, uh, location. And that's where the commuting patterns will come. Other questions? Comments? Victoria, this was awesome. Very good discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you.